And we're going to get started in just a minute here. Going to give everybody a chance to go ahead and join us again. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I think it's afternoon for everybody at this point. Um, and again, if you're seeing this video, you're here for our panel on supporting children and caregivers during stressful and traumatic events. Again, my name is Courtney Penn, and I am an early education and early ch child care specialist um, with Child Care Aware of America. Looks like we have Julie with us from Kansas. Hi, Julie. Oh, we have Patty from Indiana. Oh, Marta from Indianapolis. Awesome to have everyone on with us this afternoon. So thanks everybody for putting your information in the chat. Um, thank you for logging in from San Diego. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, so for the sake of time, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Courtney Penn. I'm an early education child care specialist with Child Care Aware of America. And today I will be take, talking with two wonderful early childhood professionals and asking them about ways that they can support um, the child care sector during traumatic times. We know that the past year has been quite a strain on child care professionals, families, and children. And we've experienced racial injustices, political unrest, national disasters from flooding to forest fires, and the list goes on. And let us not forget the pandemic that is COVID. For today's Facebook Live, we will be taking questions. So go ahead and drop them in the chat as we go along and we'll answer them after the questions with the panelists at the end of our time together. So next, I will go ahead and introduce our lovely panelists that we have with us today. First, we have Dr. Amy Shriver. She is a general <laughs> pediatrician at Blank Children's Pediatric Clinic and an assistant professor of specialty of medicine at Des Moines University. Dr. Shriver is also a member of the Academy of Pediatrics Council and on Early Childhood Executive Committee, as well as the AAP Iowa Chapter Executive Board and Legislative Committee. She is the medical director of the statewide non-for-profit Reach Out and Read Iowa, which partners with pediatric primary care providers to give books and shared reading guidance to children and families at health maintenance visits. She supports early childhood education through her collaboration with the Iowa Association for the Education of, young, of the Young Child, IAEYC. Dr. Shriver was awarded the 2018 IAEYC Child Champion Award and sits on the IAEYC Play Leadership Group. So thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon, Dr. Shriver. Thanks for having me, I'm excited. So our next panelist is my colleague, um, Holly Neck. We work together at Child Care Aware of America. Holly serves as the Director of Child Care Emergency Partnerships and has been with Child Care Aware of America for the past five years. She has a primary focus on bridging the gap between emergency preparedness, response and recovery and industry and child care programs. Holly also develops and delivers emergency preparedness training and technical assistance to child care resource and referral teams and child care program staff across the nation focused on business continuity, disaster plan development, and helping children and caregivers deal with social emotional aftermath of a disaster. Again, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon, Holly. We're so happy to have both of you here and glean from your <laughs> wisdom and knowledge and tools that will um, help all of us um, today. So before we get, to, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thanks. Before we get to our panel discussion, I want to tell you about who we are at Child Care Aware of America. We work with more than 400 child care resource and referral agencies nationwide. We conduct and share research about child care. We also advocate for high quality, affordable child care. Today's Facebook Live is an ongoing conversation about the importance of equipping the child care sector during times of stress and trauma. I will be asking the panelists questions and moderating the conversation. We also encourage you to ask questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them in the time we have together today. We're so excited to have this conversation. Let's get started. 
So again, I wanna go ahead and just have us think about where we've come from, right? 2020 was a lot. <laughs> Over the last year with COVID-19, there was plenty of uncertainties, political divide, repeated natural disasters in many parts of the country, social unrest, and the list goes on. It's been a rough time. 2020 stretched us in ways we never thought we'd be stretched before. And then 2021 started with its own set of stressors and unrest. We've seen some struggles, but we could also say that we've seen some victories, some bravery and history in the making. We know caregivers, children and families have seen a lot and been through a lot during this time. Recognizing signs of stress in children is so very important. What are some of the ways, so here I'll flow into my first question. What are some of the things we can look for in children's behavior that may be a sign that they are experiencing stress? Dr. Shriver, I'll start with you. Thanks. Uh, so you are absolutely right. In my pediatric practice, I've seen all sorts of ways that children are experiencing stress. And um, so I like to tell parents that you might notice changes in the way children sleep or changes in the way that they're eating. They may have what we call externalizing behaviors. So they might uh, be more irritable, more um, likely to have tantrums or anger outbursts, or they might have internalizing symptoms. Um, they might get quieter, shyer, less likely to um, be social. And um, so all of these can be signs. And then in our younger children, we might also see regression in their developmental milestones. So a child who was previously using the toilet might regress and be having more accidents than usual. Uh, so those would be the things that I would keep an eye out. And then um, just overall, if children are just um, being really overly fussy and just really having a lot of behavior issues. And um, at this time, the first thing you should consider is, could it be due to all the stress that's going around in the world? And one thing I'll say about the world is that although we are all under a lot of stress, it's just such an unusual time that we're all experiencing the same stress. Like everyone in the world has the same type of stress with dealing with the pandemic and there are a lot of other things causing us stress, but it's just a time where, where we can all understand better the, the importance of addressing stress and how to do that. Thank you so much. Holly, do you have anything you would like to add to that question? Sure, and I would agree with much of what Dr. Shriver said, and a lot of that transfers into the early childhood care setting too. So if you're a family child care provider caring for small groups of children, or you're an operator of a childcare center with multiple classrooms, or you work in a childcare classroom. I think first of all, keep in mind that no two children react in the same way. So that's a challenge in, a, in and of itself within a childcare program when you're dealing with multiple children. So caregivers really have to be um, really paying attention to each child's um, individual behaviors on a normal day-to-day -day basis so that they understand when something's a little off kilter and knowing that that could be a sign of stress. I think in the childcare setting, it's important to have primary caregiving and small groups so that you can really pay attention to children's temperaments, their individual likes, their dislikes, and like I said just a few minutes ago, that will really cue you into whether something's um, not really on target, um, if they're acting out a little bit differently than what they normally are. I think in the early childhood setting, you might notice some aggression. So a child that's usually playing well with others may suddenly become more aggressive, um, acting out, knocking down toys, or just seeming a little bit more, um, you know, mischievous, um, your environment may seem a little more chaotic. So they might notice some more disruption in the child care program. And that's just attention getting behavior. Children can't always verbalize, hey, I need help. So they're trying to act it out through their behavior. I think in other cases, you might notice the complete opposite, that children that normally played well with others are suddenly playing alone and withdrawing from others. So that might be a sign that children are under stress too. Clinginess. Um, is another behavior that may be present. Um, and infants and toddlers, you may notice that, um, especially the clinginess and um, really needing to be with a caregiver more frequently. 
Oh, those are great tips. Thank you both for your responses to that question. So that flows us right into question number two. Can each of you talk briefly about what ways child care programs and school age programs can help children, staff, and even themselves during times of crisis and or emergencies? Dr. Shriver, we'll start with you again for this one. Okay, hey, thanks. Um, this is near and dear to my heart because um, I feel stressed out too. I mean, you know, I think we all have just really um, come to grips with the fact that there are times in our lives when we can't control a lot of things. And so um, it's important to have that conversation and have it frequently with ourselves and our children and, um, you know, the teams of people that we work with every day. So, um, so in primary care, we talk about a lot of things um, kind of in a very succinct way. We don't have a lot of time to um, go over everything that needs to go over. So sometimes we have little ways of remembering things. And, you know, over the past few years, I've realized that it's really important to have a, a really standardized but yet um, flexible way of talking about how to deal with stress and how to become more resilient. And so um, I use the CC123 discussion. It's easy to remember because it rhymes, but it helps us really be kind of the best we can be during times of stress, both as parents and as children and as uh, care providers. So the first C is stands for connections. So anytime you're under stress, you should just realize you should never go at it alone. You should always find the people on your team that have got your back. And in, and usually in the family setting, that means your close family. Um, in school age kids, it means, um, what about my friends, right? And so um, within safety guidelines, it's important to make sure you um, make connections a priority and make sure they're, they're um, loving connections and um, strengths-based connections in your life and that um, you don't forget about those. And then the second C is coping. So adults have spent our lives figuring out how to cope. So we have developed some of those skills and sometimes it involves um, talking to friends on the phone or laughing or exercising or reading a book or taking a bath or um, just doing something for ourselves that can help us find a place where we feel more calm. Uh, in kids, kids don't always have all the coping skills that they need, but one thing is certain that in times of stress and chaos and uncertainty, children really thrive on routines and rituals. So making sure that children have great routines where they're waking up on time, they're eating meals at the same time, they're going to bed at the same time, and that they really have a predictable uh, experience in their life that they can that helps them feel safe and secure. That's a way to feel in more control when the rest of the world feels like it's spinning out of control. Um, and then the ritual part of that is important too. Like what can make that routine day a little bit special, a little bit more personal to you, something that you look forward to in your day, like sharing meals with your family or doing shared reading at night. Those types of rituals can really enhance your daily experience, comfort you, and just increase the amount of joy and pleasure in your life during stressful times. Um, and then the one, two, three part has to do with how as parents, um, or even caregivers, we can, or care providers, we can reach out to children during times of stress. And um, so one means take one moment to stop and reflect um, when a child might be acting out, why might that be? Instead of being reactive and just assuming they're being naughty, uh, try to figure out at, that every communication is, or every behavior is a communication. So they're trying to tell us something. It's our job as either parents or care providers to be like, why are you doing that? What are you trying to communicate to me? And how can I help you through that communication? If you don't have the words for it, how can I help give you the words? How can I help you label your emotions and, and help you find a way to express them in a good way? So um, helping kids understand emotions, helping them um, express them appropriately, um, and just reassuring them that everybody has emotions, <laughs> that that's okay to do, is, is part of that. And then in part of that one moment, I ask that parents and caregivers and care providers forgive themselves for not being perfect, because we, we strive for perfection, we strive to do the best we can, but under times of stress, we're often gonna miss the target. And I think it's okay to know that we won't always do our best job and that to forgive ourselves is important for picking up and moving on and trying harder, right? So forgive yourself, try to forgive some of those behaviors that you see because stress will bring out some of those more reactive behaviors as our hormones kind of increase and we have more of that fight or flight response. 
And then two of the CC123 is two eyes for seeing and two arms for holding. And that means that in times of stress, we really do need those around us to see us being good more often and to give us more physical affection um, if that's something that we like. Now, not every person likes hugs, but if you're a person who does like hugs, you might consider increasing your hug allotment for the day uh, to help you through times of stress. So many of us find that getting more positive attention and positive verbal feedback and more physical attention and love can help us through struggling times and kids really need that. And so do adults. And then finally, uh, the three, um, what are three ways that you can show your child you love or care about them every day? Um, to talk about that in my practice helps people remember that this is an everyday thing, that expression of love and caring shouldn't be just occasional, it should be every day, and that there are many ways to do it. And um, when I ask that question of people, it requires that they be reflective about it. What are the three ways that I can do that? I'm not gonna tell you the ways, uh, but I could give you some ideas so, um, you know, when you share a book with your child, that is definitely showing them that your attention is devoted to them, that nothing else in the world matters right now except you and that child and that book together. So that in doing that creates that um, safe, secure bond um, between caregiver and child. Um, so sharing books is one way. There are many other ways. And then if I'm talking to a school-aged child, I'll often ask them the same question. What are three ways you can show your parent or caregiver you love them every day? And children are um, innovative and creative and have a lot of great ways for doing that. And so it's great to just get people thinking that, hey, this is something I need to do every day. How can I do it? And what are new ways I can do it? So um, CC123 has been really helpful for me uh, going through these times of increased stress. And it's um, really been very well received because everybody is in the same boat. Everybody feels it. And it's just really important to acknowledge it. That's awesome. Thank you. I think I need to put the CC123 up in my house as a reminder for me as a professional and as a parent. So thank you so much. Um, Holly, do you have anything you would like to add to that question? That was a wonderful response. <laughs> I think I would just um, probably add again, thinking about how this transfers to the child care setting. So yeah. if you are a child care center director, self-care is so important for you so that you can be a good leader for others. But then also thinking about ways that you could build in mini check-ins with staff to just see how they're doing and creating a safe environment for your staff members to express themselves, um, a place away from the children, uh, maybe some peer-to-peer -peer networking, just an opportunity for them to talk about how they're feeling and maybe express some of the needs that they have uh, so that they can be taking good care of themselves, which ultimately will benefit the children and families that they're caring for. Proper rest, nutrition, exercise is important for those adult caregivers as well. As far as the children, I think offering a variety of activities for them to express their emotions. Um, drawing is wonderful. Dramatic play where they can just um, kind of talk about how they're feeling or act it out if they're not verbal. They certainly can act a lot of that out with the play materials in the environment. Providing calming activities. Play-Doh is a wonderful um, activity where they can push really hard if they need to or squeeze things and get some of those pent up emotions um, out. Of, and I'd say the same as for outside play, allowing them physical activity and fresh air to just really get rid of some of that, yeah. blow off some steam that they maybe are um, feeling right now. And I too agree with what Dr. Shriver said too about predictability routines. It's so important on a day-to-day -day basis with children, but especially when we know that there's so much stress that children are facing, they thrive off that predictability, familiar settings, familiar caregivings. So keep that up. Um, caregivers are doing an awesome job every day, providing developmentally appropriate activities and making sure that children have what they need. So that's really what they need right now is just that caring, caregiver and the setting and you know environment that they're used to. Awesome. Thank you for those reminders, Holly. And it's, it's easy sometimes to forget as we're helping others that we also need to pause and help ourselves so that we're able to <laughs> pour out to others and remember to, to breathe and allow children that space to do the same. So thank you so much. So you've heard us say a lot about um, child care resource and referral, or you'll hear some people say CCRNRs, and you may be wondering, what is that? 
I'm super glad you asked. <laughs> so um, CC Harnars provide many different services depending on where you live, including child care referrals and other parenting supports, child care provider training, um, technical assistance, and other efforts to increase the quality and availability of child care across the nation. So uh, we are very honored to be able to support their work on an ongoing basis. So in that vein, um, what are some of the, what are what type of resources, sorry, have you seen offered in CCRNR settings to offer support to child care, give child care givers during these difficult times? Um, I will go ahead and start with Holly for this question. Thanks, Courtney. I'll start kind of at the high level of what we do at Child Care Aware of America and what resources that we have available, and then I'll bring it down to the state and local level. So this spring, we stood up an emergency child care technical assistance center, where it can serve as a one-stop shop for quick resources to help caregivers and families deal with what's upon us right now. So there's a lot of COVID resources, but also resources to help um, through things like civil unrest and just the stressors that we're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. We have those on our website. We also have archived webinars. We've worked hand-in-hand -hand with a lot of professional organizations over the past year. The Child Life Disaster Resource um, is one example where they talked about um, what children's ultimate needs are during times of stress and how we can be a good caregiver during those times. And then there's also an opportunity to request individualized, customized technical assistance from our staff too. So I always say that that's a good starting point is to go to our website at Child Care Aware of America and look at those resources that are available. Another example that I have from this past fall was we helped a state that was not only dealing with COVID like everybody else, but they had multiple natural disasters that were upon them as well. And this particular situation, it was wildfires that were taking place. So we offered to do a Zoom half day meeting with the child care resource and referral agencies from across that state to just focus on self care for those coaches and technical assistance staff that work with child care providers so that they could be of good service to those child care providers. Kind of that analogy of putting on your own mask in an airplane before helping others, that's what we tried to do for the child care resource and referral staff. So those are a couple of examples of what we've done at Child Care Aware of America. Some things that I've seen on the state level or local level is that we've seen a lot of expansion of outreach and support to child care providers. And a lot of that is being delivered through virtual settings right now, through Zoom meetings or Teams meetings, um, because it's difficult for child care resource referral staff to get out to child care programs. But just being there for the provider and being there to hear what they're going through and having someone to talk to is often beneficial. We've seen access to mental health services open up in a lot of states where child care resource referral agencies are working hand in hand with mental health professionals to deliver services to child care providers. And even in some cases, we've seen where EAP services, employee assistance, assistance programs, have been made available to family child care providers who typically don't have that service because they're an independent business owner. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer support groups that are happening and um, openings to training and resources focused on meeting the social emotional needs of children during this difficult time. So lots and lots of innovative programs are taking place and the child care resource and referral staff across the country have been so dedicated and going above and beyond to meet the needs of children and caregivers in their state. So it's been wonderful to see but a lot of energy and work has gone into that too. So um, it hasn't gone unnoticed. There's a lot of wonderful things happening. Awesome, thank you so much. And Dr. Shriver, I know you had some tips on how to support colleagues and just friends, just supporting people <laughs> during this time. Would you like to go ahead and share that with us at this time as well? Um, absolutely, and just um, just to reflect on the similarities between um, what I do as a primary care provider and what child care providers do for their patients or their their children in their um, in their uh, care. Uh, I, I often see that we share a lot of the same mission, a lot of the same goals, um, and so we often share a lot of the same resources. And so I like to think of us 
both as this, you know, trusted source of information for children and families and trusted guidance and repeated guidance. But then I like to kind of clarify and classify, well, the way that pediatricians do it, it's more like a gentle rain every once in a while. Whereas if you're a childcare provider, it's more, it's deeper and wider, um, like the ocean. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have more chances yeah. to be involved yeah. with that child and help them grow and help them work through some of their issues and struggles. And you have um, more chances to interact with that family and provide the support. So it's kind of how I see it as we both share similar goals and um, similar methods. But, you know, little rain sprinkle every once in a while versus like an ocean. Uh, but what I would say is um, for, you know, providing some supports and resources out there for families, when I sit down with families, um, I see a lot of anxiety. That's one of the main things that I'm seeing. So I end up talking to a lot of children and parents about deep breathing exercises. And uh, then I'm like, well, you need a little bit more than just me telling you how to breathe. So, um, so one of the things I do is teach about um, Sesame Street and communities. So this is a website that's out there that is both provider facing. So if you're a child care provider or a primary care provider, if you're a shower or an ocean, you can go to this website and um, you can search, you know, based on age group or you can search based on um, one of the issues you might be having. And Sesame Street and Communities is organized with three different um, main categories in mind. One of them is cognitive development, right? ABCs and one, two, threes. And of course, both of us care about that. And but also children are facing struggles a lot with learning based on some of their challenging educational settings. So that's a great place to kind of supplement and work on some of the cognitive development for children. And then there's another section in there about troubling times, right? So dealing with increased uh, ways to promote resilience and uh, working on, through some of those behaviors or some of the feelings we have during troubling times. Um, and then the third category has to do with wellness. So it talks about um, your physical wellness and exercise and nutrition. And that's also been a big struggle for all of us during COVID. And so, um, so I like to encourage both providers to go there as well as parents. And there's some child facing material there too, um, interactive games and other things that help people work through some of the issues and questions that they have. So um, I find that to be a really great, easily accessed, relatable resource. And then Holly mentioned that one of the alleviating factors during stress is play, right? So engagement with your child or helping your child develop those independent play skills is really important. So I do spend some time talking about working, try to, try to ease yourself away from some of the screen use that we've been seeing um, and then ease your child into some age appropriate play activities. And so a couple of resources I use for that are, um, there's a great website out there called thegeniusofplay.com, which um, has just brilliant ideas for how to play with your kids. And then um, I often ask parents to explore the Vroom app, because Vroom has a lot of activities you can engage with your children and kind of learn what you can do as a parent to facilitate those really important skills. We all know that Play is the work of childhood, and we want to see them actively playing not only for that cognitive brain development, but also the social and emotional component of it, and then to get their body physically moving as well. So lots of reasons why we need to kind of look at play um, and provide supports for families about how to do that. Um, some other resources out there include, um, there is a brand new uh, toolkit created by uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Council on Early Childhood, and it's called the Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Toolkit. And it's basically kind of we've done a deeper dive into the resources that are out there and kind of um, shrunk them down into what we feel might be the most helpful for providers and then for parents and then for children. So there are three different sections there, and that's available. We'll um, help you find those resources and then um, also there's a, another resource called When Things Aren't Perfect, Caring for Yourself and Your Children. So reflecting again, Holly's um, excellent point about self-care and putting your own oxygen mask on first to be the best you can be to help support your children. 
Um, and then um, tips to promote social and emotional health among young infants is another resource out there. And then finally, the AAP has an um, early brain development section, and then that actually has some professional development resources for you. So um, has some modules for teaching, if that's something that you need to do for um, the people that are serving the children that you work for. So lots of resources out there to support both the providers as well as the children and families. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was some really great information to share with us. Sorry, I was hearing some reverb for a second there. Okay, so thanks so much. We're going to move on to our final question. Um, so finally, um, is there one key takeaway, one key resource, one key recommendation that, that you would like to share with us that will be helpful to child care professionals, medical professionals, or families as they navigate um, what has been a very challenging year? Um, so I will go ahead and start with you, um, Dr. Shriver, to answer that question. So yes, I think that the key takeaway um, for parents, and again, those are the folks that I spend the most time with is the parents and the children, is that um, stress is real. Um, this is a, a really significant moment in all of our lives for um, how, how we are dealing with our own emotions and how our children are growing up. And so um, if parents can kind of take it or caregivers can take a step back and really look at the goals that we have as parents which are to create an environment that feels safe, secure, and loving for our children as much as possible. And that's a challenge during this time. And how can we do that effectively for kids? Well, Holly said it well, which is take care of yourself and make sure you're addressing some of your own emotional needs. Sometimes parents need a time out too. So don't be afraid to <laughs> recognize that and take that when you need it and um, be more forgiving as um, was said before of yourself and of some of your children more difficult behaviors um, and try to be more understanding about why they're behaving the way they are and try to really dig deep into figuring out what what they're communicating with you and um, during times of stress we all need to have seven basic tenets for health and if some of these are falling by the wayside then then we're losing our opportunities for ideal health so I think we all know them inherently but it's great to enumerate them and to think about where we stand with each of these during uh, COVID. So um, the first is getting enough sleep. So many of us have um, irregular schedules due to um, school and COVID and work and other things. So maintaining a great routine and regular uh, quality and quantity of sleep is important for all humans. Uh, the second is good nutrition. Um, during stressful times, we're more likely to grab a piece of cake than a piece of fruit. It's been, it's been shown in studies. So we have to be um, very proactive in understanding good nutrition, both for ourselves and for our children going forward. Uh, the third, of course, is exercise. And I know Holly's highlighted that too as a, a strategy for self-care for uh, providers. So um, children as well need to move their bodies. It's good for their digestive health. It's good for their sleep. It's good for um, their brains and learning. And it's certainly good for their muscles and their development. So getting proper exercise throughout the day, moving our bodies will help us in all realms of our lives. Um, the next category is relaxation or meditation or mindfulness. So um, what happens with our bodies during stress is that we have high levels of epinephrine, we have high levels of our, you know, fight or flight hormones going in our bodies. And so we're constantly tense and we're constantly ready for something to attack us. So we need to be more intentional about reducing those levels of stress hormones, like by actively like relaxing. And that's really hard to actively relax, but um, find things that really can calm you, slow down your heart rate, some people like yoga, some people like meditation, some people just need to read a good book. I don't know, everybody's different, but relaxation should be a key part of our seven tenets of health. Um, the next is relationships. You need to have at least one caring individual in your life that's got your back, that makes you feel like you're the best person in the whole wide world. Like who can that person be? Doesn't have to be a parent. It can be anybody in your life, a best friend, a coworker, um, a clergy person. It can be anyone, but really humans are designed to live within relationships. And right now we're, we're forced to isolate ourselves in a very unnatural way. And so we need to be more intentional about relationships. And then mental health check-ins. 
we need to make sure that we're taking stock of ourselves every day. And one of my physician colleagues said, hey, check on you, check on two. That's a, um, a way of saying, you know, do a mental health check on yourself in the morning. What do I need to be my best person every day? And am I missing some stuff? And then be, be gracious, generous, and compassionate and find two of your friends, colleagues, coworkers, and check on them too. And sometimes we're not okay. And so Again, it's okay not to be okay, but like let's let's help each other out. Let's let's recognize that. Let's check in and check in on your kids too, right? Uh, and then finally, nature. So as was mentioned, I live in Iowa in January. So nature is not always our friend, but um, still, nature can be something that can um, bring us back to a state of kind of equilibrium during times of stress. So nature is is essential in our health. We can't live without it. And so we need to kind of put that again at the forefront. So um, thinking about those seven things and how we're doing with them and where we can do better will help us move forward in times of stress. Thank you so much. Holly, did you have something you wanted to add to that question as well? What I'll add is to not hesitate to reach out to your local child care resource referral. They have so much helpful information and can make referrals to a lot of community organizations. So whether it's families faced with emotional issues, stress during this time, or the, the, you know, the reason why they're stressed out, maybe it's food insecurity, or they need to be hooked up with some social supports. Oftentimes, the child care resource referral is able to make those community connections for families. We have a search function on our website. So if you go to childcareaware.org, you'll be able to search for your local child care resource referral. And you can do that by zip code. You can do it by county and state or city and state to find out who your closest connections are at your local child care resource referral. So use them as a benefit and they have so much information and such caring staff that can help families out. So that would be my recommendation. Great, thank you so much. Thank both can of you. I, can I just oh, jump in and just say that Holly is absolutely right, that um, you cannot be your best self if you're not meeting your basic needs. And so um, if you as a child care provider see parents struggling with that or family members struggling or um, primary care providers such as myself are bridges and connections to local and community based resources for families. So I think that's an absolutely very important thing to do during COVID. We have people who are food insecure more than ever, who've lost their jobs, who struggle um, economically. There are people struggling with relationships right now because of the situation COVID has put us in. And um, there is concern for increased child abuse and other things. So, so really addressing those, those basic needs in families can happen in your primary care uh, physician's office. So please refer also to us and say, hey, I'm a little concerned about this family and maybe they need some help um, because we do have resources to um, help support their needs. And, and once those needs are provided for, families can do what they have always wanted to do, which is be the best parent or caregiver for their child. Everybody wants that, but during times of increased stress, it becomes a lot more challenging. So I just wanted to highlight that was a really great point that Holly made. Great. Thanks so much. So we do have a little bit of time. So I'm gonna grab one of the questions from the chat. Um, it says, I'm a family child care provider. I have three expecting mommies. Um, are, there any, are there any new COVID protections for infants other than the new standard ways we can care for, in, for toddlers and preschoolers? So Holly, do you wanna talk about what child care organizations are thinking about that? One thing that I would say is, um, you know, doing the things that we're always doing, which is as adults masking, as kids over age two wearing masks um, and then hand washing and then staying home when sick. These are the basic things that we need to keep doing um, even as things like COVID vaccines roll out. Um, I will say that it's important to note that if you are someone who's received a COVID vaccine, um, that is actually improving your own um, immunologic health and it doesn't make you contagious or anything. So, 
So if you are a mom who has had a COVID vaccine, your breast milk is fine to use. Don't be afraid to use it. I've seen people say, oh, like, is this infectious now? No, it's not. So, um, so I think the standard precautions that we're all used to with these infants is what we recommend. Um, we still are having mothers breastfeed their children, even if mothers have had COVID. So we don't you know, discourage anything like that. And um, so I think it's it's really over the past year, we've gotten really, really familiar with the standard recommendations for COVID precautions. And um, so I would continue to do that. And it'll be a long ways away before we are able to vaccinate children. Um, so the, there will still be these rules and regulations in place for a really long time. Thank you, Dr. Shriver. I think the only thing that I would add to that, I think you explained it very well, is just to, you know, try to integrate outdoor play with children as much as possible so that they're getting fresh air, they're not so close to one another in an enclosed space. So thinking about how to integrate more outdoor activities is important. We have a blog post on our website that focused specifically on that topic that was published this fall. So if you're interested in that, you can certainly look for that. But I think, you know, first and foremost, you as a child care provider are doing so much on a day-to-day -day basis to reduce the risk of illness already. Um, you're practicing good hand washing, you're keeping your spaces clean. So keep that up. Um, don't let your guard down. As more and more people get vaccinated, we still need to really take all the precautions that we can and make sure that children stay safe and that families stay safe. So um, keep up those daily safety measures that you've always had in place to reduce illness. And I think that you'll see some positive things um, come about because of that. And just to dispel some fears, we, um, you know, been collecting data over the past year about uh, maternal health um, and uh, infant health for COVID. So, you know, speculation about um, are there any um, congenital effects of COVID for mothers who are pregnant? Um, the answer is no, we haven't seen any of that, which is great news. You know, there are some illnesses like um, chickenpox that if you get it as a pregnant mom, like there are going to be some problems maybe with your child when they're born. So um, with COVID, we haven't seen any congenital effects, which is great. And then um, the maternal child transmission of COVID. So if you're a mom who's pregnant and has COVID, um, what is the likelihood you'll transmit it to your child? The good news is that that is really low. So because of ex expert labor and delivery um, precautions, we've seen it as low as 2%. So um, I think there's a lot of fear around that, but I just wanted to dispel that and say we're seeing very low transmission rates and we're seeing healthy children being born. So that's great news. Um, and thank you for sharing that, Dr. Shriver. And thank you so much, Holly, too, for your insight on all these questions as well. Um, so our time together has ran through so fast. Um, we received some really great questions. So if we did not get a chance to get to your question, please know that we are gonna work to get your questions answered. Even if you're watching the recording after the live, um, we will work to um, get your question, do our best to get your questions answered as well. So I just wanna wrap up and tell Holly and Dr. Shriver, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time and the resources that you shared with us. Um, as I mentioned before, Child Care Aware of America is here to support families, child care providers, and child care resource and referral agencies. We hope we can continue to stay in touch with us on, on Facebook. Um, and you can also learn more about us at www.childcareaware.org. So th again, thank you all so much for joining us and we hope that you have a great weekend and remember to try your best <laughs> to stop, relax, take a breath and practice some self-care this weekend. And remember, it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process. Even if you've only got like five or 10 minutes sometimes, use it. <laughs> and also remember that self-care doesn't have, is not selfish, it's a needed part of our day-to-day -day living. Um, and if you still feel bad about taking time for yourself, just tell them that Tell everybody that Courtney told you, you have to do it. <laughs> so again, thank you all so much. Um, Dr. Shriver, Holly, any um, goodbyes, thank yous you want to say yeah. before we wrap up? Thank you so much to Child Care Aware and um, 
you know, the AAP is obviously concerned about the health and well-being of all children. And so I would just encourage everybody like during this time to really like don't lean away from your child's health, lean into it, make sure that they still are going to their pediatrician's office during COVID, make sure they're getting their dental visits, make sure they're getting their eye checkups. Like these are really, really important things. And please make sure they get their vaccines on time. So um, we care very much about you. We have a lot of good resources for you. We wanna see you. And so um, please, please visit us and please um, lean into your child's health during this time, both their social and emotional, their physical health and their mental health. So, and also their educational health. So, <laughs> um, and just thank you so much for doing what you do. And Holly, um, thank you so much for doing what you do for children. So again, the, the ocean of love that you guys provide is, is so important and we'll continue to do our rain showers as well. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shriver. It's been a pleasure to work on this with you. And thank you, Courtney. So <laughs> glad that everyone was able to tune in today. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and weekend. Bye-bye.